Now, TikTok is probably has my most impressive video. I've got a video with over a million views on TikTok. Uh, a million views, a hundred thousand likes, which is to me, it's like, it's like a number on a screen, but legitimately I created something that over a million people watched. What's up, guys? Welcome into another episode of Cutting Up with Jonas Satcher. I'm your host, Jonas Satcher, and today we have avid Philadelphia fan, the founder, creator, editor, host of Triple L Sports, Lucas Larson. How are we doing, my man? Doing pretty good. I'm excited to be here. Excited to be here. All right, my man. Uh, what are we going to do today? Same as always? Yeah, same as nice always. Go down to ball on the sides there, keep your comb over. No hard part or hard part? Uh, no hard part. No hard part. We can clean up the beard as well? Yeah. Awesome, my man. So I want to talk about your channel a little bit. What's the name of it? Give it to us. It's uh, Triple L. You can also find it on a lot of social media, Triple L Sports. Yeah. So uh, tell us about it. What made you uh, What made you want to start it and uh, what is it? Oh, man. We're going to get heavy with this. Let's do it. Uh, Let's do it. So I started the channel uh, two years ago, back in 2021. And the reason why I started the channel was at the time I was working a sales job and with sales, you get, you know, base a salary, but you also have commission on top of that. So you got to make commission to basically like, you know, do well, which for the most part, like in 2020 went pretty well. But when we got to 21, um, Caitlin had actually had some stuff happen with her job. And so she lost her job, not lost it, but she kind of just had to basically make a decision. It's like, you know, with, with us being Christians, they had sort of like questioned her on a few things and had asked her like, you know, just with, with COVID and them kind of being worried about being in, peop in population, you know, they saw how big our church is and essentially, you know, us going to church services and nobody wearing masks and anything. And it just made them, you know, ask her like, oh, you know, are you, are you constantly doing this? And it was like, she basically had to come to a decision of like, you know, am I going to have to either like watch church remotely or actually physically go to church or like basically stay working at this place? And then they kind of like made some other comments too to basically like think, make her think that, you know, they didn't really want her there anymore with like basically how she felt about COVID and masking and vaccines and stuff. And she was just like, you know, I'm kind of having to like make a decision off of like my own personal values and how I feel about this stuff or keep working there. And, it was pretty stressful. So she got to a point to where she was like, I'm not going to go against like my personal morals and that I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave and just kind of leave it at that. Not burn any bridges with anybody, but I'm also not, you know, willing to, you know, basically go back on how I feel about things. And that sort of kind of cre created a little bit of a problem with us financially, where it was like, you know, she's not bringing me any income. I'm working a sales job. And she was pregnant at the time too. So I was like, man, I got to figure out a way to where I'm not relying on like a business that I can be self-sufficient in some way, shape or form. And I started thinking about it. I was like, you know, I've always wanted to like do YouTube. I've always wanted to like do videos. I've watched these other guys, you know, kind of got inspiration from like T Hype and Chris London and Jesser and like what they were doing with their YouTube channels. And I was like, I like sports. So I started trying to get into it and I was like, I'm just going to create this sheen team channel. Like I would always second guess myself whenever I wanted to do things like projects and stuff or wanted to just like try to do other things than what I was typically doing. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to like, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to like drag my feet on this. I'm just going to gonna get into it. I'm going to teach myself how to do it. And hopefully it turns into something. So it was like sort of the origination of it really started as like almost a necessity of needing to make money. And then over time, it's sort of grown into like, just like a hobby that I really like doing and I just really enjoy it. The idea of analyzing like the subscribers, who's watching videos, where it's dropping off and then having a channel based around sports. To me, I love sports. I like talking about sports and with the latest series that I've started doing, I feel like I can focus on 
a lot of different things that I liked at once. Yeah, man, I think having that passion is so huge, isn't it? I mean, like you said, you know, you're talking about sports, which is something that you're already going to be talking about anyway. You know what I mean? You're already going to watch the Sixers, you know, finals run. You're already going to watch the NCAA March Madness tournament. You're already going to watch the Eagles. So why not take that love, that niche, something you're already doing, and then turn that into content? You know, I think obviously coming out of COVID, YouTube, all these things, content creating became so big and so many people wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to, they want to start a podcast. They want to do these things, but then, you know, it's not necessarily, they don't have, you know, necessarily one thing that they've got that passion and that niche for. And I think that if you can find that, that's what makes all the difference in the world. You know what I'm saying? And, and having that, it makes it so much easier because it's like, look, I'm going to do this anyway. If it has to be a job, that's when it becomes difficult. Like if they want to, if you were going to start up a channel or a podcast or whatever on some, on, on the barber industry, it would never succeed because you don't have that passion and drive for it. It would be a full-time job. But if you can find something that you love, then even if it doesn't take off, even if it doesn't go to the masses and you're one of the best, you know, biggest podcasters in the world, you're doing something you love. And so it's still easy and it's still worth it to you. You know what I mean? Like you would do your channel, which obviously you've begun to grow now and you're, you know, pushing over 500 subscribers and, and you're starting to gain some traction. But even if it was 50 subscribers, you would still do it. You know what I mean? I think that's what makes it so cool. It makes it fun to watch people like yourself because like you genuinely love to do it and you would do it if there was a little to no audience either way. You know what I mean? Yeah. So tell me a little bit, go ahead and give me your, your biggest video. What's been your most successful video so far? So just from a YouTube standpoint, the most successful video that I've had so far is a uh, essentially a college basketball revamp on uh, NBA 2K. And I did that video about two years ago. And at the moment, it's at 15,000 views. Now, TikTok is probably has my most impressive video. I've got a video with over a million views on TikTok. Uh, a million views, 100,000 likes, which is to me, it's like, it's like a number on a screen, but legitimately I created something that over a million people watched. That's yeah. like the population of Knoxville times like seven, which yeah. is, it's just like insane to me to, to think about that because the most amount of people I've ever witnessed at one point was like 50,000 people at a needles game. Mm -hmm. And to think that like however many times, like 20 times that amount of people watched a video of mine, it's like... It's pretty cool, That's, isn't it? Yeah. Or oh, however many. Somebody's going to check the math and be like, this guy's an absolute moron. He doesn't know how to catch me. <laughs> but it's still going back. It's like crazy. But to me, it's like with, uh, with even with you, you know, you could have just very easily said, you know, I don't want to take the risk of opening my own shop. I'm just going to go work for somebody else. Like you, you, you know, basically bet on yourself and you have a, you know, support group around you. You have, you have friends that will come and patronize your business. And, you know, you do, you do great work. So people want to come to your barbershop, but you could have very easily just said, you know what, I'm just going to, you know, take the easy route and play it safe. And, I heard somebody say a long time ago that like you never get anything that you don't ask for. Like very rarely does something in life actually get handed to you. And to me, I felt like, you know, I wanted to have some experiences that just the average person doesn't have. Like being a huge fan of UNC, there was this guy last year, he got a chance to like go out on the court, hit a three pointer, met with like the director of operations for the basketball team, got to like see the facilities, like the average person who doesn't have an in or the, just get really lucky doesn't get to experience that sort of stuff. And, you know, the guys that I followed that sort of made the baseline for, or not the baseline, but really like were, were the example that I wanted to follow. Um, you know, Jester just got to be at a, a celebrity in the celebrity all-star game this past weekend. Like, People don't, the average person doesn't get those type of experiences and, and being able to follow something that I, I'm really passionate about with sports, it could also lead to having like really cool experiences of being able to go and be part of like a game day in Chapel Hill or be part of like a celebrity game. It's like, will I ever be that big? Who really knows? But the opportunity is higher than if I just said, you know, I'm just going to play it safe and just go find a job somewhere else and not even bother trying to learn something new. And to me, I think that that's sort of the cool part of it is, you know, a business, a YouTube channel, content creation. There's a lot of learning. There's ups and downs. And 
to me, it's like, you know, if you're constantly learning, you're just going to keep getting better. And the more effort you put into it, the more that you get out of it. Well, I think it, it kind of goes back to exactly what I was saying, man, when you say, you know, the average person, you know, the average person doesn't see what happens going on behind the scenes either, man. And the average person isn't willing to do what you've done. You know, you watch these guys on YouTube that you're talking about and they have, you know, all these millions of views and they get to do all these cool things. And so many people want to do that, but the average person isn't willing to put in the work that it takes to get that, right? Like I, we opened it up, I gave the intro for you, creator, founder, video producer, editor, cameraman you know what i mean you're doing it all from the beginning you make these videos and we've talked about it you've spent what 13 14 hours sometimes on a 15 minute video you know what i mean and so most people they don't they don't see that and they're not they wouldn't be willing to do that they want the easy route how can i just get big and go do the celebrity all-star game but they don't want to sit there behind the scenes and have to do all the editing and do all the work and do all these things and that's where you lose the average person and that's where i come back to it being like it's got to be something that you really genuinely passionate about that if nobody watched it you would still do it you know what i mean and that's the difference in that with you I think with myself, with a lot of people, it's like, I don't have to be, this This podcast, this channel doesn't ever have to grow to more than 100 subscribers, 150 subscribers, and I'd still shoot the videos, you know what I mean? The same thing mm -hmm. for you. If it never grew, you would continue to do it because you've already been doing it and you just genuinely and love doing it. And that's where it's like, if people can find that, where it doesn't matter, the numbers, take all the numbers outside of it, take out all the money. Is this something you genuinely do? Um, I genuinely love cutting hair. I genuinely do this every single day and wake up and enjoy it. So I'm gonna do this, whether there's cameras, whether there's an audience or not, you know what I mean? Same thing with your sports. I think that's the difference is it's like, yes, the glamor, the, the fame, all that is enticing, but that only lasts you for so long until you've made five videos and we you've sat there 12 hours in the editing room and you wanna scrap the whole video. That passion, the money, the drive, the fame, that's where everyone starts to lose it, you know what I mean? So finding that thing and having something that you love genuinely with no audience, that's the key to me. So let's, let's talk about your channel because I do wanna promote it a little bit here. Where are you at now in your channel? Obviously, I I really found out about you and your channel during the North Carolina run last year. I think that was kind of when you started to have a surge. You started to gain some traction. You were kind of documenting every single game. As soon as a game ended, there was a video, and you were talking about the recap, and you were you were promoting it. You followed their run all the way through the Final Four, all the way to the championship and losing. Where is your video, your channel at now? Because you're not just North Carolina. I think a lot of people probably found you during that time and thought mm -hmm. this is a North Carolina guy. You're not, you are an avid North Carolina fan, but you're not just a North Carolina fan and you do more than just North Carolina videos. You started a segment, you were telling us a little bit about it here. I want you to talk about it. Where's the channel at now? What are you doing right now? So when I'll take you through essentially when I started and how the content has in a way evolved. So when I first started, I was actually doing a lot of Madden uh, videos, mm -hmm. just rebuilds and typical stuff like that. And uh, I thought that I had some good ideas, but I'd kind of found out that, you know, I'm not nearly as good at video games as other people who make better videos than I do and will always be better at video games than I will be. And to me, it was like, not exactly what I wanted to do. So I sort of shifted from that and I used a, uh, a video, uh, which was is still my highest viewed video to date, a video which was kind of like a combination of UNC. So I was able to show a little bit of my passion about North Carolina basketball and, you know, basketball and games. So I basically took uh, a NBA game and made it into a college basketball game and used UNC for the thumbnail and that did really well and then later that summer I did another video which is essentially um, a prediction video about North Carolina season the new players that they had brought in and I put a lot of effort into the video because I was thinking you know if I use something to start off the video that's enticing if I can use a lot of clips in the video instead of it just being a talking head because relatively speaking the average person who just clicks on my video they don't know anything about me they don't really care what my opinions are but if i get them to stick around long enough with something else that will keep them watching the content maybe they'll subscribe and then maybe they will care what i have to say about things and so when i did that video about unc's uh postseason and the season looking forward 
that video did really well and I gained some subscribers from that video and I think to that to this point it's like my second or third best uh, viewed video and then over time um, I started doing uh, like a lot of UNC videos uh, documented their run last year and I started realizing that I wanted to hit a larger niche than just UNC fans and I'm still going to do those videos but I wanted to hit the broader aspect of just generally sports fans all the way from basketball to football to even hockey. I wanted to hit a little bit of everything and I started thinking of video ideas of what I can do and I realized, you know, I, I like history, I like looking up statistics, looking at things in context and that's when I got the idea of the wild world of sports which is obviously a play on the wide world of sports which was like an old program years ago and the wall world of sports i got the idea of going through and essentially reliving looking in context the major events in sports history so essentially if something crazy happened something interesting something unusual if that happened i could make a video about it and give it to somebody that essentially the origin story of it the context the actual happening and then essentially like the aftermath and I based the videos, sort of the uh, the structure of the videos, a little bit off of another channel called Dead Meat. And uh, he he does a um, a series called like the Kill Count, and he goes over like horror movies. And I'd like caught one of his videos one time, and I was like, this is really interesting. He's essentially giving backstory to this movie as he's giving like the plot points of the movie with videos of the movie. So like you're watching like a mini movie with like a like a sort of like a documentary built into it and it has like a comedic effect but i was like this is really interesting the way that they structured this so i thought maybe if i did like a short almost like documentary type video with context the information of what happened to an interesting thing that happened in sports maybe people would like it and when I posted the video, I was like, I'm going to like do my best to learn new editing tricks, to learn different ways to make this so that I can retain the audience a little bit longer and then hopefully grow the channel faster. So that was one idea that I had. And I have another idea, which I don't even think that I've even talked to you or anybody else about this yet, but I'm also going to do another series that is essentially a how-to series, but it's like, how to ruin your franchise and then the details all the failures of the browns throughout the years or <laughs> how to build a championship team and it's basically like lebron assembling like the avengers to go and beat the celtics like basically just a, a how-to video and it's all like comedically based but talking about how a team really messed up their chances of success or how a team who should have won did it and I think that those two ideas, if done right, could turn out to be something really big and could go into even making the production even larger than just a guy in, in his house making videos. If I'm going to talk about something that happened in another city, you know, if I'm going to talk about like Yankee Stadium and the failures of the new Yankee Stadium, I can, you know, buy a plane ticket and fly to New York and actually go to where the old Yankee Stadium used to be and be like, all right, well, this is what happened here. And then go over to like the new stadium and then like detail the history of the Yankees and like see if I can schedule a tour of the facilities and basically make like a real production out of it and go on site and actually like do cool stuff and being, you know, there at will not only just add to the production value, but also just make the content just that much more intriguing. And uh, it really is funny growing a YouTube channel. I, I, I like Mr. Beast. He's got the most uh, subscribers out of anybody on YouTube, but he's actually really a, a good example for how simple these, like, the process for success is on YouTube, but also an example for how difficult it is. If you look at a lot of his old videos, I mean, he's just throwing stuff at a wall to see if it'll stick. And he's not, was a really a good content creator for years and years and years, but his success came out of just trying different things and finding something new that works, but also just being obsessive about it and putting in insane amounts of work just to make sure that he finds success in it. And he talks about how you find success and he says just 
you know, find something that you like doing, put as much work into it as you possibly can. And then just from an actual perspective of like finding success on YouTube, he says, just from the videos, if you have a good title, a good thumbnail and good content that keeps people watching the video, that's really all you need. Cause it can be overcomplicated in the sense that people, you know, look at, well, uh, well, you need to rank in the search rankings and you need to, you know, create content that has multiple titles so that you can, they can find it as search ranking and find it just scrolling across. But you can, you can tell me and, and even you're like in a, a, a testament to it. Whenever I want to watch something on YouTube, I just open up my phone and I just scroll until I find something that's interesting. I'm not, you know, most of the time I'm just doing that. I'm not really like actually searching for something particularly unless like, you know, I need it. Most everything comes from the timeline. So really trying to search, like rank in a search isn't quite as important as it is just making something that an average person would just want to click on and watch. Definitely. I love that you're willing to be flexible. You know, a lot of times people get an idea and it could be a great idea, but then they get, you know, their pride will get in the way or they'll get stuck on one thing or one thing will be a little successful and then they run it to the ground, you know? And I think that especially for somebody like you, who's in the beginning stages, you know, you had some success with North Carolina. And so you want to take that success and you want to continue it and you want to use it because you know it works, but then you also don't want to get stuck in a rut as well. You know I mean? You're willing to try. Obviously, if something completely blows up, then yeah, stick to that. But as you're kind of growing and trying to see what works, you're willing to be flexible and try different segments and know like, hey, that didn't work. I'm not going to be too prideful to continue trying to do the same thing over and over again. I'm willing to pivot. Let's find another idea and see if it works. Because like you you said most of our ideas aren't going to work most of our things you know i've i've heard it said success comes wrapped in a box of failure you know what i mean you're gonna have to fail multiple times before you succeed so you got to be willing to pivot be willing to be flexible be willing to say yeah that was a bad idea let me try a new segment see if that works and see if that does well i'm glad to see and glad to hear that that's kind of where you're at where you're like you know what i'm i'm doing this one right now and i'm gonna do my best i'm gonna give it my all i'm not gonna shortcut it all but i also have other ideas and i'm willing to pivot and if something works a little a bit better then we got to move to that you know what i mean you can't be so stuck in your ways or so stuck on what you think success looks like for you that you're willing to throw everything else out of you know throw everything else out so that's awesome man so you've done how many years because you do kind of year by year right like worldwide for the, for that segment anyway yeah it's like you know you'll do 1991 or 2005 and you're talking about all the crazy things what so far, because I know you've researched multiple years, I don't know how many videos you've put out. So far, tell us what's the most interesting season, the most interesting year of sports content. Well, it was actually the one that I started with, 1990. So uh, I I originally had the idea of doing it as like a year in review. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite honestly, I, it just seemed like it was too much work because I started going through every single year and I was like, you know, there's going to be some years that are that just nothing really important happens, but it's also going to be really difficult to actually find good resources. You know, I don't want to use Wikipedia as like exclusively my only resource because there are some there can be some inaccuracies there. So I got to point to the point of like instead of doing a year in review, I'm just going to focus on like the major happenings. So initially that was the idea, but. I started with 1990 because I felt like that was just it was crazy of the amount of things that happened that year. Um, you know, you had the, the Pistons where they had went back to back and won another championship, but that was sort of like the uh, beginning of like Michael Jordan deciding that he was going to put in the work and then essentially lead his team to two, three peats. So the Pistons had won back to back, but that was like the origin of like the Bulls in the 90s. Then in baseball, Baseball was like a really interesting year because they had a lockdown. Then after the lockdown ended, they had the season in the World Series. Like in the game that sealed the World Series, a dude ruptured his kidney and had to go to the hospital. He was on the winning team. Uh, there was a college basketball player that collapsed on the court and died. And ironically enough, he collapsed on the court in front of Eric Spolster, the guy that was the heat coach. So this guy who was like one of like the next upcoming stars in college basketball just like died. But it's even crazy looking into the backstory of it and that he was already warned that he had a heart condition and that it wasn't necessarily that it went undiagnosed, 
but his doctor decided to basically let him make it through the season with some medication and it kind of turned out to be that his heart just gave out on him and it was just it's just like a really sad story about this guy with all this potential had a great get one of his best games of his career against Shaq in LSU and he like dominated the game so like this guy was by all intents and purposes was supposed to be really good and just died in the pride of life so as a Heat fan, when you said the name of Eric, Sh- Eric Spolstra, you know, uh, uh, that that gets me going. What was he doing there? He was a player. He was on the court. So he was on he was on the other team. And uh, when this guy collapsed, you know, Eric Spolster was on the court playing for the other team and was standing in front of them. So, like, Spolster was just a guy on the court. Wow. God collapsed right in front of them. Wow. I didn't know that. I didn't know he had anything. Yeah, so it's like, uh, you know, the NFL season. The NFL season, you know, was like another year of the 49ers, you know, dominating the league. But in that off season, there was a bunch of really good players, and it, that was the origin of, you know, the 90s Cowboys with Jimmy Johnson, Emmett Smith, Troy Aikman. You know, they had a, had a, a trade that essentially led them to getting some more picks. So, that was like the beginning of another dynasty. So there was all these different things that happened within that particular year, even more so than the average year, where you're like, man, there's like some all-time players that came in the drafts. There were some all-time teams that either showed up or had the origin of like their dynasty start in that postseason. So it was a lot of things that went on from it ended like an individual subject that I've reviewed at this point. I think that like the most interesting thing, and of course I'm still only a few into this, but like the incarceration of Brittany Griner, that's the video coming after the 2016 finals are new. To me, that whole thing is just, it's hilarious. Like it's sad and hilarious all, all at once because you know, there's laws that are significantly different over there and their punishments are just so much farther than what they are here in the States. But then you also have the aspect of it too, where you know, she went over to Russia and basically felt how 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 nice things are in here in America in comparison. And there's like just a strange level of ir- irony of uh, her not wanting to stand for the anthem and the values that we have in our country. But then she goes over to another country and kind of gets that experience of how significantly different things can be. So, like, she got over-punished, but you have that weird level of uh, irony there, so. Well, I know we're in the off-season, but let's talk about your Eagles. You guys signed my my safety, Terrell Edmonds. You took him away, but you guys lost some guys in the the defensive back. I'm actually not very sad about Terrell Edmonds, honestly. I was going to pretend like I was, but I'm, <laughs> it's got to happen. You can't really pay him, but, you know, maybe you're excited about him. How are you feeling about the off-season? You think you guys got a chance to get back, and uh, you willing to pay Jalen or what? They have to. I think that it's no doubt at this point that you have to pay Jalen Hurts. The thing that I'm the most concerned about is the safeties, which I had meant to ask you, you know, how was Edmonds when he played for the Steelers? Was he any good? Was he inconsistent? Well, we didn't pay him, so take that for what you want. <laughs> well, we didn't pay him C.J. Gardner Johnson, and he was like tied for the league in inter- or tied for the lead in interceptions in the league last year. So, But you're about to pay Jalen Hurts. We're not about to pay Kenny Pickett, so we don't have – an excuse. We've got a few years before we have to do that. No, I I never I mean, he's a first round pick. To me, he never lived up to the hype. Was he a was he a good safety? Yeah, I mean he was decent, but he never made he was he never made the place for me, man. I, I obviously we have Meek on the, you know, the other side playing safety and he's amazing. You know I mean you get the pick sixes, you get all the good stuff. Trauma is a little bit more of like the dirty work, but I mean just didn't really do it for me. You know, we, the Steelers have a long line of safeties. You know what I mean? We've got yeah. Troy, we've got Ryan Clark, we got, you know, now we have Minka. And so it's like, I don't know. He never, I never liked him to be honest. I'm glad we didn't pay him. But it, it sounds like they found a place for perhaps. Is, is he a solid starting safety in the league? I think so. But I mean, what did you guys pay him? Like a one year contract, you know? Like you yeah. guys didn't go overboard on him, you know? So it's, it's the, t- the typical Eagles, you know, you have Howie Roseman that manipulates the cap to mm-hmm. find a way. He, I was bothered because Gardner Johnson was the one guy who I felt like out of everybody that they could have lost this offseason, I felt like he was the number one guy that they needed to bring back. And it sounds like by all means, they did everything right. And from what it looks like in the reports, it says that uh, apparently his agency misjudged the market. 
and it, co it ended up costing him money because they had offered him like a three-year deal when free agency started. They didn't want to take it. They were waiting to field other offers, and apparently they didn't get another offer like it. So Howie moved on, and he ended up re-signing a whole ton of players that he quite honestly brought back more players than I thought that he was going to be able to, and we still have like $20 million in cap space left, which kind of goes back to the fact that, yeah, cap space does matter, and you have to have cap space to an extent in the NFL, but anymore, it's just having smart accounting. If you can figure out a way to manipulate the numbers, you can bring back as many people as you want, so long as you have the actual cap space numbers to manipulate. You know, if you don't have any cap space, you can't sign anybody. Dude, I'm but if you have enough, you can give them enough of a base and then do guarantees and stuff to basically, you know, cheat it. I think the salary cap's irrelevant at this point. There's so many ways around it. I mean, these guys, they have they have people that sole job is figuring out how to work around the cap and how to manipulate it. And it's, I mean, if, you're, if your team's still basing off the salary cap, I mean, come on, man. Yeah, so they were able to bring back a bunch of their defensive linemen. Of course, you know, they lost the guy that led the D-line in sacks outside of Reddick. He, he led the tackles in sacks. So they lost uh, one of their starting tackles. They lost uh, both of their starting safeties. But I think all in all, they have enough draft capital meant to uh, make a, a big trade. And that should get them back. You know how hard it is as a Steelers fan because you guys have made the Super Bowl a few times in your lifetime, not just overall. So... It's hard to get back, but I think that they're going to give themselves enough of a shot, you know, in comparison to the other teams. Check this out, my man. Go ahead, grab the mirror. Tell me what you think. Look good? Yeah, it looks good. Out what you expected. Get the back for you there. Oh, yeah. Perfect. That As always. You, well, Lucas, I appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, give us the name of your YouTube channel one more time. Triple L. Just Triple L. Yep, YouTube channel is just Triple L, and then the handle on all the other social media is Triple L Sports. Now, I know you've said before that there can be some confusion with Triple L. What do they need to put in to make sure they get to your channel? Just put in Triple L Sports. Triple yep, L yep. Sports. Add the sports. You're on there. They'll avoid the thirst trap. What are we at on subscribers? 522 on YouTube, uh, 853 on TikTok. Let's go. Let's go. Well, let's help them. Let's help them out. Let's help them get to... 550, 600. When, when, do you have any goals in mind? I, I need to hit. I need to hit a thousand before summertime. A thousand before mm -hmm. summertime. So yep. let's, you know, my couple subscribers. Maybe we'll slide over there and help you out and and promote your channel, man. Appreciate you for coming on, guys. Yes, sir. Thank you. Go Sixers. Not really because I'm rooting for the Heat 100. percent But yeah, you know, maybe you get some good luck your way. Hey, the Sixers and Heat may face off in the first round. I don't you know. Don't, you don't want that. You don't want that. Jimmy Butler. The fact that you guys let him leave. Biggest mistake in 76 years. Yeah, we, we history. kept Simmons and he's, you know. Biggest mistake in six years <laughs> in Chuck's history. But I agree. Thank you guys for watching. Like, subscribe, and we will see you guys next time. Peace out.